Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to the book of Joshua, A Type and Shadow. Um, today we are uh, looking at um, uh, chapter 16. So in these lessons, we are discovering more of how the book of Joshua is filled with uh, types and shadows of other things, such as the kingdom of God, the eternal Christ, and the finished work. And as we look at the Old Testament, many people often think that the book of Joshua or any other Old Testament book would not contain so much revelation of eternal truth established by Father God in eternity past and who declared the end result of who you were created to be from the very beginning. As we continue in this verse-by-verse -verse study, it is important to look at all Scripture through the proper interpretive lens, which is Father's eternal and unconditional love for His creation. So it is my goal as a teacher to look and see what Father was trying to reveal within a people of long ago, even as he was interacting with their version of their human experience, the journey of their human experience. And um, uh, so anyway, let's get started as we dig deep into the well of Father's mind within and see more types, shadows, and symbolic messages from the book of Joshua. So today on this episode, we are looking at lesson number 74 from Joshua chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Um, <clears throat> so let me double check here, make sure we are uh, public. Uh, let's see. Um, so edit live video. Just real quick, give me a moment. Um, let's see, we are live and... So it doesn't say where we are, but I'm pretty sure we are public. And um, anyway, um, all right, so let's get started. Now, uh, from the book of Joshua, uh, as we continue in this verse-by-verse -verse study, um, yeah, so I, I can't really tell if we're public or not, but we should be. Okay, all right. So as we continue this verse-by-verse -verse study, uh, let's look at Joshua 16, verses 1 through 4. All right, it says this in the New King James. Uh, the lot uh, fell, literally went out to the children of Israel, uh, the children of Joseph. So now we've been talking about many different tribes. We were talking about Caleb um, and so on last time. But now we're talking about Joseph uh, from the Jordan. To, by Jericho to the waters of Jericho on the east to the wilderness that goes up from Jericho through the mountains of Bethel. Uh, Bath, Bethel. Uh, verse 2 said, Then went out to Bethel, uh, to Luz, uh, passed along to the border of the uh, Archites uh, at, at Athroth, and went down westward to the boundary of the uh, uh, 
Joplites. I know that's butchering that. Uh, as far as the boundary of Lower Bath, uh, Horan, uh, to Gezer, uh, and it ended at the sea. So the children of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim took their um, inheritance or their possession. So as we now are in chapter 16, and we are still seeing some land descriptions of uh, being divided um, or or um, um, or, or plots here, uh, dividing of plots. Here we see that the lot went out to the children of Joseph from the Jordan by Jericho. But what does it all mean? So let's look at this. We're going to look at some commentaries. To start with, I want to look at totallyhistory.com. It says Joshua 16 is about the allotment of Manasseh and Ephraim. This chapter first describes the, uh, the allotment of Joseph, which was a vast area of land. This started from the Jordan, uh, Jordan in the Hebrew, which was towards the east of Jericho, uh, where the springs are found. From there, Joseph's allotment went up to the hill of the region called Bethel and, uh, and through the desert land. Uh, this area crossed the land territory, uh, which was inhabited by the Archites, uh, which was in Athroth, Atroth, uh, also crossing over the territory of the people called the Jephalites. Jephalites. That's probably closer. Uh, it goes uh, fa as far as the lower Beth Horan regions past Gezer. Uh, it ends as soon as the land meets the Mediterranean Sea. The descendants of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim were to receive their inheritance. Uh, the land that was given to Ephraim, according to the clans, was this. The boundaries of the Ephraimites uh, was the land that went up to Athroth, uh, Adar, uh, which can be found in the east side all the way up to Upper Beth Horen uh, and on until the Mediterranean Sea. From the land known as Melkmeth, um, uh, was, uh, was found in the north. It curved toward the east side of and past uh, uh, Teneth, uh, Shiloh. It crossed Joan. Uh, uh, which was on the east side as well. From Joan, uh, the land gi given stretched to Athroth as well as to Neira. It went through uh, Jericho, um, which is similar, but it's not Jericho, and touched on the Jordan River. From the land known as uh, Tupath um, uh, and further west, borders hit the Kav. Uh, Kana uh, Ravine and met the other border as uh, as it ended in the Mediterranean Sea. All the land was given to the descendants of Ephraim and his clan. All of this included the towns as well as villages that were occupied. This was set aside for the Ephraimites. However, they did not dislodge any of the Canaanites, okay, they did not dislodge any of the Canaanites. I want you to think about this because all we think about is how the, the children of Israel took over the land of Canaan and they actually, you know, all that they were supposed to have done. However, we need to understand that there was more to the story than meets the eye, right? So what we see is, is how that um, they did not dislodge the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. Until this day, they are in that area, but are forced to do heavy labor. Okay, so what a vast historical record of these events. And just to clarify, it is uh, in this chapter that we see the name Bethel, it's Bethel, uh, as actually uh, called Bethel Luz, as translated in the LLX or of uh, the Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament. And as far as the boundary of Lower Bethel, Horan, uh, to Gezer, uh, it, uh, the, the phrase, it ended at the sea, or literally the goings out of it were at the sea. So 
it's it's good to see these translations and see that there really are some different word meanings that are really important to the story. Now, from EnduringWord.com, uh, concerning Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, uh, the inheritance of the sons of Joseph, uh, it says, The lot fell to the children of Joseph from the Jordan uh, by Jericho to the waters of Jericho on the east to the wilderness uh, that goes up from Jericho through the mountains of Bethel, then went out to Bethel to lose um, uh, passed along to the border of the Archites and Athroth, uh, Atroth, uh, and went down westward to the boundary of the uh, Jephelites, uh, as far as the boundary of Lower Bethel, Hor uh, Beth, Haran, to Gezer, uh, and it ended at the sea. So the children of Israel, uh, of the children of Joseph, rather, Manasseh and Ephraim, took their inheritance. Now, Joshua 16, verse 1 in the New English translation uh, says, the land allotted to Joseph's descendants extended from the Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho to the east through the desert and up on from Jericho um, into the hill country of Bethel. Now, from a translator's note, uh, from the, the, the New English translation, it says the Hebrew is said to be interpreted to read, the lot went out to the sons of Joseph from the Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho to the east, the desert going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel. So uh, as we continue, I want to I wanted, you know, set up a plot here, set up a story. Uh, PreceptAustin.org concerning verse 1, the commentator Kenneth Gangle uh, writes, Jacob gave his longest and most favorable blessing to his son Joseph. We cannot understand the allocation of rich fertile land in central Canaan to Ephraim and Manasseh unless we review and understand that blessing. Uh, this is from the Holman uh, Old Testament commentary on the book of Joshua. Now, uh, as, as we look at, uh, at nationally, uh, nationalgallery.org, um, this is an interesting commentary from the UK. Uh, Joseph, uh, it says, Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons. His father loved him more than any of the others and gave him a colored cloak. We know the story of the coat of many colors. His brothers were jealous of him and sold him into slavery. He was taken to Egypt and eventually became steward to Potiphar, uh, uh, one of Pharaoh's officials. Potiphar's wife tried unsuccessfully to seduce him, and after false accusations were levied, uh, leveled uh, at Joseph, he was imprisoned. Due to his ability to interpret Pharaoh's dream, he was made governor of Egypt. He wisely rationed the country's produce in preparation for a time of famine. Now, during the famine, Jacob's son came in, uh, to Egypt to plead with Joseph for supplies. They did not recognize him, but after he was satisfied that they were reformed, uh, he identified himself with great joy. Joseph invited his father and brothers to come and settle in Egypt. The story is recounted in the Old Testament, Genesis 37, 39, and 45. Joseph is often seen as an Old Testament equivalent or prefiguration of Christ. Okay, so we know that. We, we see types and shadows in the Old Testament, and Joseph is one of those types and shadows. Now, according to uh, wikipedia.org, Joseph is an important figure in the Bible's book of Genesis. He was the first of two sons of Jacob and Rachel. He is the founder of the Israelite tribe of Joseph. His story functions as an explanation for Israel's residence in Egypt. So, very interesting. Now, keep in mind that the, the passages of our Bible, we have in English uh, interpretations which hold a view of mankind's journey of their human experience as they gave an account of their version of how God interacted with them. Uh, good to have Pastor Barash uh, uh, 
Bashrat um, uh, with us this morning uh, watching uh, and, and others. Okay, now I don't think that what we read from many different translations are always accurate. However, we need to look carefully as we interpret scripture to make sure we see the intentions of God toward all of his creation. So we have the English scriptures. A lot of Bibles around the world in different languages came from out of the English King James Version. The King James is not an accurate version. It's not the first translation. It's not the first uh, accurate translation. It is a translation that w w predominantly was created for one half of Britain while Britain was at war and divided. So it was just half of Britain. That Bible was for them. He wanted a Bible for his own half of Britain, not for the whole world. But the whole world has adopted it, and we get a lot of study helps from uh, the King James Version, and there's many other translations before and after even today. So it's not, they're not all perfect, and they're not all wrong. Uh, it's important that we look through the English interpretations at the original language, and we look for what did God intend to speak or to reveal. So as we look at Joseph, we see land being allotted to Joseph's descendants extended from the Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho at the east through the desert and on up from Jericho into the hill country of Bethel, of which the Hebrew word Bethel is used as house of God, which is known as an ancient place and seat of worship in Ephraim on border uh, of Benjamin identified with Luz. So as you recall, Jacob's blessing on Joseph and thus the, the on Manasseh and Ephraim uh, had been as his favorite son. And, and we know this is true. We've seen this uh, all, all of our lives. We've seen the story of Joseph, Joseph the, in the coat of many colors and, and uh, sold into slavery and, and uh, put in a pit and, and all those things by his uh, brothers who were jealous of him. But notice this, from preceptaustin.org, commentator Alan Ross writes this about Genesis 49, verses 22 through 26. This oracle treats Joseph more lavishly than any of the others. For here the main blessing lay, and the, the cliff note here, uh, or the reference, uh, says 1 Corinthians uh, Chronicles 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Jacob took up the promise of fruitfulness from the name of Joseph's son, Ephraim, which means fruitful, and lavished the promise of victory, Genesis 49, uh, and prosperity, uh, Genesis 49 and verse 25, on Joseph's two tribes. All right, now think about this. Joseph's two tribes, we talk about the tribes of Israel, but as we name them, we're looking at the tribe of Joseph that is given and promised land in Canaan. Now, victory in battle was experienced by Joshua, Deborah, and Samuel, uh, all of um all of the tribe of Ephraim and by Gideon uh, and Japheth, uh, uh, yeah, Japheth, uh, uh, both of Manasseh's tribe. In these verses are several marvelous titles for God. The mighty one of, of Jacob, the shepherd, uh, Genesis 48 talks about that, uh, the rock of Israel, your father's God, the almighty, uh, and, and so on. Uh, the one who ensures blessing from the heavens above, uh, in essence, rain for crops, and etc., from the deep below, or the streams and the wells of water, and from the breast of uh, and womb, uh, in essence, the abundance or offspring, uh, Jacob bestowed on Joseph the greater blessings because he was the prince among his brethren, uh, Josh, uh, Genesis 41:41. All right, so very important information, uh, but what we need to understand here is that um, uh, as, as, as uh, these scriptures, um, um, uh, the uh, commentator uh, Rai, uh, R Y R I E, Rai, or Ray, uh, writes, um, uh, writes that the blessing of Joseph is the most equal 
equivalent of all, or the most eloquent of all from Genesis 49, uh, are a brief summary or a bi biography of Joseph. In later years, Joshua and Deborah were from the tribe of Ephraim, and uh, uh, let me make sure I read that right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and Gideon uh, and and Japheth um, from the tribe of Manasseh. So we see a brief history of Joseph, who is biblically known for his coat of many colors. Right? Okay. Well, commentator Gangel. Uh, continues, Joseph was responsible for the survival of his family during the famine in Egypt, and even prior to that was Josh, uh, Jacob's favorite son. So rather than a specific and single blessing on Joseph, Jacob ordained that his sons Ephraim and Manasseh should be the heads and founders of the tribes, along with their 11 uncles. Okay, now, Side by side, uh, they and those eleven were uh, Joseph's brothers. Okay, out out of twelve. All right. So side by side, they occupied what later became Samaria with Ephraim on the south and Manasseh on the north. So you see the tribes of Manasseh, the tribes of Ephraim, and so on. Well, that's how all this came about. Now, Ephraim's land included Shiloh, which we, we've heard about that, we've talked about that, where the tabernacle would be located. Uh, Manasseh uh, included both Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim at the famous and, and sacred site of, of Shechem, uh, as well as Mount Carmel, sticking like, a, uh, sticking like a knob out into the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you can see that on, on a map, okay? This is from the Holman Old Testament commentary on the book of Joshua. Now, so there's a lot of a lot to be said here about Joseph uh, here where uh, uh, and the plot of land assigned to him and his clan. However, let's move on to Joshua 16, verse 2, and see more here. From the Net Bible, it says, The southern border extended from Be uh, Bethel, uh, used as house of God, uh, to lose, L-O-U-L-O-O-Z in the Annunciation, lose, uh, used as almond tree or could be growing, and cross to uh, Arki, used as lengthy, uh, at, at the Arki territory at um, uh, Adaroth. Uh, used as crowns, okay? So these definitions here are really powerful. Uh, and we need to pay attention to them, and, and I'm going to let you put the pieces together uh, as we talk and, and teach here, and if, if it, you know, hopefully it works for you. Uh, if not, I'll try to explain as we go. Now, from a translator's note in this verse, concerning the southern border, the Hebrew says it, okay, so it talks about it, meaning the referent, the southern border, has been specified in the translation for clarity, and it extends from Bethel or Bethel to Luz. Also, this parcel of land, I notice this, cross to Arki, uh, lengthy territory uh, at uh, Arath, uh, meaning crowns. So, from a translator's note, uh, in the Hebrew text, the place name Luz has the direct uh, the directive ending in indicating that the border went to, from Beth Bethel to Luz. Elsewhere, Luz and Bethel appear to be names for the, the same site uh, from Judges 1 verse 23. But here, they appear to be distinct. Now, note that the NIV translates, uh, the New English, uh, the New International Transla Version, translates from Bethel, uh, that is Luz. Here, following the reading of from the LLX, the the uh, the sub Septuagint, Septuagint uh, the Greek interpretation of, of the Hebrew Bible, uh, from Bethel or Luz. So this may seem like a simple allotment of land, but for me, the meaning behind this is that the plot of land given to Joseph and his clan is the land predestined by God uh, through the mouth of Moses. As in the as in house of God, okay, 
uh, where continued growth will take place with longevity in their future and where they are crowned with good things to come. So that's just kind of a synopsis of these meanings. Now, to me, there is always a picture of greater things. When you look at your life, I don't know what you see, but you should always see a picture of greater things. God always does greater things. Uh, because God does not give decreases, but always increase, which is just a simple matter of following predetermined, predetermined, a, a predetermined plan for our lives. Now, even the times where it seems like there's decrease, don't focus on that. Okay, that's not the focus. Think about what God is doing based on what God has promised. Okay, not one. Don't let your experiences outweigh truth all right so stay focused on the truth now from preceptaustin.org on verse 2 uh, as far as the land allotment the smith's bible dictionary comments on bethel and Luz or almond tree it says that it seems impossible to discover with precision whether Luz or bethel represent one and the same town the former the canaanite and the later the Hebrew uh, name, or whether they were dis, uh, uh, distinct places, uh, though in close proximity. Now, the most prof probable conclusion is that the two were uh, the two places were during the times of preceding the conquest. Uh, distinct, Luz being the city, and Bethel being the pillar an altar of Jacob that after the destruction of Luz by the tribe of Ephraim, the town of Bethel arose. Okay, so not necessarily the one and the same or separate, but one is the extension of the other, it seems to me. Now concerning uh, uh, Adaroth, Adaroth uh, which I've been calling Atroth, um, uh, used as crowns. The Holman Bible Dictionary place name meaning crowns. Now here's what it says. Village on the border of Benjamin and Ephraim, Joshua 16.2, 2, uh, 16, 2, uh, Joshua 16.7. Uh, it may be modern Kerbet uh, El Oga uh, in the, val uh, the Jordan Valley. Also referred to uh, a town desired and built uh, by uh, uh, by uh, the tribe of Gad, Numbers 32 and Numbers uh, uh, 30, 30, 32, 3 and 32, uh, 34. Uh, Mesha, king of Moab, about 830 uh, BC, uh, claims he captured Adaroth, uh, but admits it belonged to Gad. From, uh, from of old and had been built by an Israelite king. It is located at modern Kerbet Arras, eight miles north of Dibon uh, or Dibon and eight miles east of the Dead Sea. Okay, so again, a lot of history, a lot of information about land plots. So let's get on with this so we can get to the, the, the punchline, as it were, or the types and shadows. Now, Joshua 16, verse 3 in the Net Bible says, It then descended westward to Yafleti, uh, 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 yaf, yaf, yaf used as uh, let him escape that Yaflati territory, as far as the territory of lower Beth Horan, um, uh, used as house of hollowness, okay? Um, very important. And Gezer, or uh, Gezer, used as portion, and ended at the sea. Now, from preceptaustin.org, concerning the, the Jordan in the east, then west toward the Mediterranean, the border went toward the west through the territory of the Jephalah, Jephalites, uh, not much of which is known otherwise. All right, so I want to look at commentator Grant because here's what he writes. Two further landmarks are provided to identify the route that the southern boundary took, Beth Horan and Gizer. Both places have featured uh, in the narrative prior to this point. So we've seen that, you know, several times. Beth Horan was 
uh, the place to which uh, the uh, Amorites, uh, kings, uh, fled to, uh, with Joshua, defeated them at Gibeon, uh, Joshua 10, 10 and 11. Uh, the king of Gezer came to assist uh, uh, Lashish in the, their battle with Joshua uh, and was defeated. His city is thought to have been approximately 15 miles uh, from the from the sea. From Gezer, the boundary went to the sea with Kiel, uh, Kiel uh, uh, Dilitz, uh, assuming that it went toward the the northwest to the north of Japho, uh, which was assigned to the Danites, according to Joshua 19:46. Now. I realize we're not there yet, uh, but, but we're we're working our way to, in that direction. Okay, so so then let's, let's add Joshua 16:4 uh, to this to the mix here. It says Joshua's descendants Manasseh and Ephraim were assigned their land. Okay, now that takes care of these four verses, but there's some some things that I want to show you yet uh, in this study. So uh, bear bear with me as we uh, as we move along here. Okay. So, um, so from a translator's note, um, let me see here. Okay, so from a translator's note, uh, this could read uh, received their inheritance. So uh, the the new the new English translation says uh, uh, says uh, land, but we're talking about an inheritance here, an allotment. The inheritance. Now, I want to read you a, a fair piece from uh, Precept Austin dot org on verse four, uh, and then we'll we'll get to the the rest of this lesson. Now, uh, notice this suggestion. Although I have made some uh, uh, attempt using dictionary descriptions and some commentary notes to sort out these specific boundary names in Joshua 16, five through nine, which we'll be looking at next time, uh, I would advise not getting too bogged down in uh, with the names because many of the locations simply are not still not known. Uh, don't miss the forest for the trees. I love the way this commentator is addressing this. He talks about verses five through nine, which we'll be looking at next time, uh, shows God's attention to details regarding his promised blessing. To the tribe of Ephraim understood the boundaries of their blessing, for they knew these locations, even if we do not today. Now, before I go on with this commentary, I want you to understand, when we look at the boundaries of these blessings, these blessings, these inheritances, this land was their blessing, and there were boundaries. In other words, this blessing was limited, okay? There were boundaries. You know, the difference is today, our blessings are without boundaries, okay? They're only based on what you believe. Now, let's go on. Ephraim understood what God had blessed them with and did not have to guess. God is a God of order, not confusion. The son of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, received their inheritance. This verse ends the description of the one lot given as Joseph's inheritance. Now, in the following sections, the borders and cities of Ephraim and Manasseh are described separately. Did you notice the order of Joseph's sons in this verse? First Manasseh, he was literally the firstborn, and then Ephraim. Uh, the, the, the note here says same order in Genesis 46 uh, and 48. But then jo Jacob, soon to uh, pass on, makes the following declaration. Now, you're addressing Joseph, two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt uh, are mine. Jacob, Jacob in uh, essence, adopts them. All right, Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, now, the note here, Jacob mentions Ephraim before Manasseh uh, shall be mine, as Reuben and Simon are, are uh, in Genesis uh, 48. Now, then Jacob, uh, then when Jacob bestows a prophecy and a blessing on Joseph's two sons, he does something unexpected. Joseph took them both, 
Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel left, Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right. This would be the hand for blessing, the firstborn, the right hand always is symbolic of the hand of blessing. That doesn't necessarily mean that today, but in, in, in the Israeli culture, the Hebrew culture, that was kind of the thing. And brought them close to him. Now, but Israel stretched out his hand uh, and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. He blessed Joseph and said, God be before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who has been my um my shepherd all of the, the all the life of my days um the angel who has redeemed me from all evil bless the lads and may my name live on in them and the names of my fathers abraham and isaac and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, uh, it displeased him. And he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh, uh, uh, Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the one firstborn. Uh, the one uh, is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people and he also will be great. However, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. He blessed them that day, saying by the name of Israel, uh, by is by uh, uh, saying by uh, you Israel will pronounce blessings saying may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh then he put he uh, put Ephraim before Manasseh Genesis 48 okay so 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 now the uh, now Joshua follows the same order as Jacob and first blesses Ephraim and then Manasseh in according uh, in according uh, in accord with Jacob's prophecy blessing. All right, so you know to simply spell it out here, uh, the blessing is what most people often require of the Lord as they search the Bible to find scriptures to confirm what God has promised. And 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 and, and I get that. Okay, now now listen. We're after blessing. Why are people after blessing? Because they don't understand they're blessed. Okay, this is why people all over the world, world, and this is the U.S. included, call themselves poor. Poor people. You're not a poor people. Okay, you're only a poor people because you perceive yourself in that way. But the truth is, you are who God says you are, who God created you as, and that is as blessed. Amen. God calls you blessed. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we need to get our stuff together. We're blessed. We need to call ourselves blessed. We need to call ourselves and only call ourselves what God calls us. So we live in a needy world, right? Uh, and, and remember that the children of Israel equated their inheritance of land as a tangible way of feeling close to God. However, once you come to know that you are blessed, because at creation, the eternal Godhead called you blessed and deposited all that he is within you, then tangible things no longer determine uh, the sign or knowledge of blessing. Listen, you're blessed because God says so. Therefore, tangible things do not determine your blessing. Uh, if you look at the tangible, it does not, it is not the, having wealth, having many things, does not determine that you're blessed. Notice this from commentator B.F. Meyer. He writes on Joshua 16, 4, And the children of Joseph took their inheritance. Now, what a wonderful wealth of blessing these children of Joseph came into. There was the precious things of heaven, uh, the dew and the deep that uh couched beneath the precious fruits of, of the sun and of growing of the moons 
uh, the metals of the ancient mountains and the everlasting hills, the precious things on the of the earth, the fruit, uh, the, the the fullness thereof, and above all the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Uh, Deuteronomy 33. Now surely they were blessed with all manner of blessing, more than they had asked or thought the rich gifts of God's grace, an inheritance, listen to this, which could not have been won by their prowess uh, or arms, but was the free gift of God's love to be taken and enjoyed. These things happen to them as types and spiritual counterparts of all uh, of all uh, our uh, 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 that all are ours in Christ. He is precious, nay, priceless. His promise, see, you're blessed with Christ. Christ is your blessing. Listen, Christ is your blessing, and he is, is priceless. Uh, his promises are exceeding great and precious. The blood by which we are redeemed uh, in our thinking, in our mind, uh, is precious has meaning not yet explored. Uh, the very trial by of our faith is precious uh, as the uh, uh, gold taken from the everlasting hills. How much preciousness uh, uh, there is for us who believe, 1 Peter 2, 7. But we are poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked because we are not taking our inheritance. Now, that's what uh, one of the churches in the book of Revelation, uh, it speaks about them. But here it says, this is the case because you've not taken your inheritance. So if you call yourself poor, if you call yourself sick, if you call yourself discouraged, you call yourself defeated, you call yourself down and depressed, that's because you have not taken your inheritance, not because someone has not given it to you, because God has given all things that pertain to life and godliness to you. So he goes on to say, we need to do more than ask for it. He that asketh should not rest uh, until, uh, should not rest satisfied till he receiveth. We must take by faith which claims, appropriates, employs. Open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ that he may cause you to receive and enjoy all his precious gifts. In Christ, all things are yours. Go in and take, uh, go in and possess, take your inheritance. Believe that you do receive. Thank him and go on your way rejoicing. So that's a fair piece of, of information, but it really does describe the blessing of the Lord. And the blessing of the Lord uh, 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 is not about uh, having wealth or, uh, or of monetary value, uh, but it is uh, uh, available with, uh, when needed, okay? Um, and, and, uh, and I just think that we have really uh, uh, distorted this thing because uh, we don't understand. We don't understand we're blessed. So that's the one thing everyone has to do, okay? So to understand we're blessed. All right. Now, I want to look at a scripture from Proverbs 10, verse 22 in the New King James Version. It says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. If you're looking for riches being money, that's the wrong focus. I'm not saying you can't have it. I'm saying that's the wrong focus, okay? Uh, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Then why is it that people that are seeking blessing, seeking prosperity, seeking wealth, seeking riches, are just so sad, it's just so troubling for them? Well, that's because they have not truly received that which belongs to them. Proverbs 10, 22 in the Passion Translation says, True enrichment comes from the blessing of the Lord with rest, and contentment in knowing that it all comes from him. So to live the, in the blessing of the Lord, everybody wants to live there, in the blessing of the Lord, whatever your version of that might look like, to live in the blessing of the Lord with rest and contentment can mean with no labor or sorrow attached to it. 
It is resting in the knowing that everything comes from him in terms uh, that he, uh, that the blessing of the Lord was created within you and I uh, and is manifested by living from rest and contentment. Amen. Uh, it's very important that we understand that. Very, very important that we understand that. Okay. Now, um, uh, for me, the blessing of the Lord is not as much as a, a promise as it is an endowment or a gift from within. So a type and shadow here in this setting, in this lesson today, is that much like the children of Israel, sometimes we think what we want is what we need and that what we want is a cover up for an inner fear and insecurity of thinking that your creator has or ever will uh, let you down in some way. It's like knowing that your father loves you and will never leave you, abandon you, or let you down. And yet at times, fear tries to enter in and choke out your confidence in God. Yet this is when you stand up straight in faith and trust the one who created you and created all things for you. Now, this is an important lesson today when we talk about the blessing of the Lord. Because if you're still hung up on, I'm blessed only if I'm not sick. I'm blessed only if I have money in the bank. I'm blessed only if my ministry is paid for. I'm blessed only if my family is provided for. I'm blessed only if there's no dissension in the church uh, and all is well. No, that's not the blessing of the Lord. Those are surface things. Those are external things. The blessing is what you know that God has implanted within you at the time of creation. That's the blessing. That's what you're to hold on to. That's what you're to hang to. And uh, I just believe that we've gotten this thing kind of distorted, kind of backwards, and we really do need to not pressure ourselves, okay, uh, about uh, uh, whether we're blessed or we're not blessed. You're blessed because God said so. That's the bottom line. Hang on to that. Live by that. As he is, so are we in this world, First John. As he is, so are we in this world. Listen, what is he? Is he blessed? And so are you. Is he whole? Then so are you. Who are you? Who is he? Think about who he is. Is Jesus sick or is he whole? He's whole and so am I. So everything that he is is who you are. I just want to be an encouragement to you today. Listen, have a great day. Join me tomorrow night for a special message on Kingdom Dynamics. Friday morning, uh, Dr. Catherine Hume will be back with me at 10.30 uh, a.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. So we'll see you in those shows and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everyone.